The first thing that I want to do is talk about some things that are helpful to know towards the end of pregnancy. Um, just some tips and some, some things that um, can help you as you prepare for labor and birth. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about optimal positioning, but before that I want to give you two little things that are my favorite, favorite things for people to do as they get closer towards the end of pregnancy. One is adding dates to your diet at 36 weeks. Um, it's recommended that you eat six dates a day, or if it's the big dates, the Metadrol dates, um, you can do four. But it's really good. Um, it's a really good thing to do. It's a good thing to add. Has anybody heard of this before? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Really. Horrible. I forget why, but I've heard of it. <laughs> yeah. So it's there's actually been really awesome studies done to show the benefit on a pregnant person's body specifically to help with labor. Um, it has shown to, on average, decrease labor time by eight hours, which is pretty incredible. Um, it just, there's some, there's some sort of chemical property in the dates that help just prepare your body for labor and start that cervical softening. Um, as with anything like this, it's not gonna cause you to go into labor. It is not a labor induction method whatsoever. It really is just to help prep. Um, so you would start that at 36 weeks. And it's also shown to help people not go too far past their guest state. Like, you know, I'm talking like 42 weeks or something like that. Like it, it kind of helps people keep within the dates. Um, no pun intended. Um, but, but also just that labor time, which can be super helpful. The second one of my favorites is adding pregnancy tea to your diet. Um, you really can start that anytime. I say 36 weeks, literally the only reason I say that is because of things that people read on the internet and get freaked out about this tea. Um, but again, it's tea that is 100% safe starting from day one in pregnancy. Um, it's red raspberry leaf tea. Hi, come in. Grab a packet of info. Um, just outside the door, yeah. Um, red raspberry leaf tea. So this is like just a great tea for women in general, but specifically during pregnancy, it's like a uterine tonic. So it helps prepare the uterus for labor. Um, this is a tea that's also been shown to decrease labor time and length of pregnancy. So again, not going to cause labor at all, um, but it, it's a great tea to add in if you haven't already. Um, the two things that I like to add to that tea are nettles and oat straw. Nettles is a great tea to add that's going to help maintain a healthy blood pressure. Um, super important in pregnancy. It's one of the bigger things that we see towards the end of pregnancy that can creep up in people. Um, so anything that you can do naturally to keep that at a good healthy level, the better. And this tea is really good at that. It's also helpful to maintain healthy iron levels. So even if you're taking an iron supplement, that's no big deal. It's not going to put you over the, the threshold for too much iron, but it is going to just help um, maintain healthy iron levels. Oat straw, the reason I love that is because it helps relieve anxiety. And anxiety is like a major thing in our world um, these days and in pregnancy too. And so it just is kind of a calming herb. So all three of those is, in my opinion, the perfect tea. You can certainly add other things too, but you would take, you would drink three to four cups of those a day, which I know is a lot. Um, it doesn't mean that you're drinking, like you have to drink three to four little cups of tea a day, because I think that seems like a lot. But what I used to do was I would put it in like a French press. I bought the herbs in bulk. Um, I would put it in a French press in the morning, let it brew for as long as you can. Um, 10 to 15 minutes is enough, but if you can brew it even for a few hours, that's great. And then I just put it in my water bottle and I drink it as one of my water bottles throughout the day. Um, you can add honey to sweeten it, but super, super good tea to add um, to, your, to your diet right now. So those are my little fun doula tips that I like to give people. Um, but let's move on and we're going to talk about optimal positioning. So in your packet you have this image and I've got a heart next to the most optimal positions that we like to see a baby in towards the end of pregnancy. Now, 
before 35, 36 weeks, your baby has a lot of room to move around, so you don't have to worry so much about this. Um, there's some other positions on here. Obviously, there's some reach positions. We're going to just assume that your little babies are head down. Um, and some of these other more um, complex positions we're not going to talk about because they are quite a bit more rare where they're more face presenting. Um, the ones that are most common are going to be these two and then the ROP and LOP, which means posterior. You might have heard of that before or sunny side up. Um, so once you reach like 35, 36 weeks, this is when you can start thinking about things to do to get your baby in this optimal position, the ROA or LOA. Um, because then once your baby kind of runs out of space in there, and also once they engage in the pelvis, they're more like, likely to stay that way. And the, so that's where we want them versus the posterior position. We don't want them engaging into the pelvis in that position because it doesn't mean they can't turn. They can. It's just a little bit harder and sometimes we have to put a little work into it, um, especially in labor, which is really what we want to avoid. So the posterior position is the main culprit of back labor. So we want you feeling your contractions in the front, down low. What happens with these other positions is people feel most of their contraction, if not all of it, in their back. And when I talk about labor tonight, um, oftentimes I'm not going to describe it as painful. I like to describe it as uncomfortable, as intense, but there are certain things that can definitely move labor into a painful category, and back labor is one of them. So there's things that we can do to help back labor if that does happen in labor, but if we can avoid it, that would be ideal, right? So um, I'm gonna give you some tips on how, where's my baby? Oh, I didn't get the baby. I'll go get it. It's, it's just in the MST room. Okay. Um, it's not a real baby. <laughs> it's a fake baby and pelvis. Um, but I want to show you the difference in how a baby moves through the pelvis in these different positions. Um, so, but there's definitely things that you can do to encourage your baby to be in a more anterior position versus posterior. Um, so good posture, it doesn't mean you have to just sit up straight all the time. If you're at home and this is your time to relax, maybe you're watching TV or something like that, being in a forward leaning position is good, like this. So just wide knees and just letting your belly hang. It just, it really does feel good. Um, it's gonna take some pressure off of your back and any forward leaning position that you're doing encourages baby to be in more of an anterior spot because their back is going to, versus like this, you can imagine, right? Like baby just slides to the back and lays like this. But if we're like this, it's gonna encourage that heavy part of their body to be more like this, which is what we want. Um, in the car, if you do a lot of driving, um, versus putting your seat kind of back at a tilt as your belly grows. Move it back, but still be sitting straight up versus slouching back. Um, so those are kind of the two main things. Um, if you have an exercise ball at home, um, if you don't, that's okay. But I do think it's a good thing to have at home. It's going to be really great in pregnancy. It's going to be great in early labor and even postpartum because it gives you something to bounce on with your baby. Um, so it's, it's a good thing to have, but sitting on a ball instead of a chair is a nice thing to kind of switch it up throughout the day if you're able to as well. And then there's some different exercises that you can do as well, and we're going to go over those. Um, you want For these exercises or positions, um, you just spend a little time doing each one every night, starting at 36 weeks. So it can just kind of be your routine, if possible. And these things are really, really great at encouraging baby to get in a good spot. Two of these things that I'm gonna show you tonight, I'm gonna to show you a forward-leaning inversion, and I'm gonna show you rebozo. Um, those two things are things that we would also do in labor for babies that are in tricky spots. It could be a baby that's posterior, or it could be a baby who's getting hung up on the pelvis too. Usually a baby that's getting hung up on the pelvis is 
in more of a posterior spot, but sometimes babies are in here, even if they're anterior, and sometimes their heads are just tilted like a little bit, so they're like this, and then it's like, whoa, 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 every time you have a contraction, <laughs> and it causes slower progression um, and things like that. But those are things that your midwife will recognize and the birth assistant, and if you have a doula, they will recognize, and they're gonna have you do different positions, but the, the forward-leaning inversion and the rebozo are some of the things that they will likely have you do. So if you're doing them in pregnancy, it's going to come very naturally for you to do them once labor starts because they are harder to do when you're actually contracting and in labor. So for the forward-leaning inversion, I'm not going to have you guys do it, but I am going to show you how to do it because um, it's good to make sure that you're doing it correctly. Um, when you do the forward-leaning inversion, you always want to do it with a support person. Um, most people can get in and out of the inversion just fine on their own, but it's good to just have someone there in case you do have a hard time getting in or out of it, or if you like fall over or something, but you're not going to fall over. But I'm just saying, have a support person, okay? Um, it's important. So when you're doing this though, it's just 30 seconds a day. That's it. You don't need to do it any more than that. It's literally just 30 seconds. It's going to look different if you do it in labor, but in, in pregnancy, it's just 30 seconds. Um, because you are going upside down, sometimes it can cause a little bit of a head rush. If it causes a head rush, just get out of it. You don't have to stay for 30 seconds. Just come out of it and then try again the next day. And it should get better each time you do it, and eventually it won't give you a head rush, um, and you'll be able to get through the 30 seconds. But sometimes people have to build up to that if you're not used to it. So this is a pretty good height, but like a couch is fine too. Um, for taller people, you know, it just depends. A bed, too high, unless it's like a platform bed or something like that. Um, but this seems, this is a pretty good height. Um, so you can put a pillow down below, like if you have carpet floors, if you have carpet, you probably wouldn't need to. So when you're doing it, you want your knees open wide like this. And then you just want to slowly come down first on your hands and then eventually on your forearms like this. So flat back and you just stay there in that spot for 30 seconds. Um, I want to be really clear that this does not cause babies to go into a breech position. Um, I've had people be very worried about that. I've had people even hear that before. It's not true. Um, now, if a baby is breech, the inversion actually is something that is recommended to do, um, but it's not going to cause a head down baby to go into a breech position. Um, basically what it does is it really helps relax these ligaments and relax your pelvis, your hips, and it allows baby to find their way into a good spot. If your baby already is in a good spot, it's okay. You still can do the inversion. It's not going to be harmful. It's, it's only going to be helpful. So the other um, few exercises, being on hands and knees is great. So just spending a little time on hands and knees each night. Um, again, that's a, that's a forward inversion type of um, position. Um, like that cat cow stretch, does everybody know what cat cow is? Like where you arch your back and then let it go. Um, that's a good one too, and that's gonna help just relieve pressure off of your back. Um, and then I wanna show you guys the rebozo. So for the rebozo, I have this one, which is actually a real rebozo from Mexico, which is super cool, but most people don't have that, and that's okay. Um, it's really, it reminds me of like one of those really big scarves, like a wide scarf. So if you have one of those laying around at home, you can use that. A Moby wrap, um, if you guys know what that is, if you have one for your baby, great thing to use. Um, I've also used like top sheets, like for a bed, that works just fine, some blankets, but just something around this size, it can be bigger, um, but this length is good. And um, the material, like this is a little stretchy, which is nice, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. So who wants to be my model? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Let's do it. I okay. found out that baby is actually breached, and this is something that can happen. Oh. That I haven't it done yet. How many so, weeks for you? Try it. There's a. Oh, that baby. <laughs> it's okay. It's, you can. There's so many things to do. It. Yes. Oh my gosh. You should. There's yeah, so many things. 
This is what I'm going to get you up at. Be doing your inversions, girl. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know it was only 30 seconds. I'm like dying down there for like three minutes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to get to five. <laughs> no. No. Now, uh, well, I'll tell you that in a minute. That baby still breached for three minutes? Jeez. <laughs> no. So you, I hold it like this. This is the best way, I think, to kind of give you the most uh, resistance. And then I just pull up. And then, and you're pulling up quite a bit. Like it's an arm workout. Um, and the person really needs to communicate with you, you know, when you're doing this. Is this too much? Is it too little? Is this okay? Yeah, it feels good. Yeah, okay. Are you trying to like <clears throat> remove all? Yes, all like the pressure. pressure. You all can do pressure. a little more. A little more. Is that okay? Yeah. <laughs> 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 um, so, and then I just go like this. So this is called sifting, um, and you can just feel really good. It relieves pressure off the back, um, but it also en encourages baby to get into a good spot. So, yeah. this is one of the things. So, so yeah, cool. try this at home with your partner. Um, and like I said, communication is super important. Um, so, because you're probably gonna be lifting up more than you would think that you are. Um, it, it takes a lot. So, but yeah, you more inversions for you a day, not one. Yeah, like three. <laughs> three a day for 30 seconds. Yeah. But yeah. We'll get, we'll get that little bubble picture. My toddler's done my support person. So, yeah. Oh, great. <laughs> Have you tried the ironing board? Yeah. Like laying the sand? Yeah. Yeah, a little. Yeah, I, I did that with my last. I didn't like it that much. But, but when you, does your upper body and your head like kind of just like sulk at the end? Sorry, On the so ironing sad. board? Like, I haven't had a big enough ironing board, so that's part of it. But any time I've done it, I feel like I slide down. Yeah, I do too. Whatever it is, it's terrible. We can talk after this. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I had a breach one too at the end, but um, so yeah, those are just a few different things to be mindful of to get baby in this spot, and then I'll just show you the difference. So. The baby, if it's in an anterior position, um, you know, like I'm just gonna have it like this. It, it just slides right through. Like that head, it's just so, the little arms are in the way right now, but it's just so different. Um, and, and you can just tell why it, it would be a more, like a smoother process in that spot and why it's trickier when baby's like this because it gets, the baby gets hung up. On, on the tailbone here on the sacrum and it also it's the pelt the front of the pelvis too so that's why with um, this sunny side up posterior position labor is longer it's harder the pushing stage is quite a bit more difficult um, especially for a first-time person so that's why we want to do everything we can to, to not have that but I don't want you also to be like freaked out about it if it does happen. Like if labor starts and you're like, oh my gosh, it's in my back. It's okay, there's lots of things to do. It's just some work that has to be done in labor. Um, and we definitely can get baby, sh baby to shift. So, so don't, don't worry if that does happen. We got some tricks up our sleeves for that. Um, so the, the next thing I wanna talk about before we start talking about the stages of labor is how emotion is tied into um, labor and its importance and the role that it plays, the, the role that your um, emotions play. Um, it's really important and it is so good to get these things out now versus having them show up in the birth room or in your labor at some point. If you have really significant fears or significant anxieties, it doesn't mean that they I'm gonna turn this it doesn't mean that they won't show up. They probably will in some form or fashion. But if we've talked about it before and we kind of know that that's out there, it's going to be a lot quicker to move through that when they do come up in labor, if they do come up in labor, because you can feel it, you recognize it, and then move through it. 
Also, if your support people know your fears and anxieties, they can help you through those too. Um, so it's really good to get those out on the table um, before things start. And I want to just talk about how it works and, and why it's so significant. So this um, little chart thing, it, it's just, it goes through what, what happens when fear and anxieties show up in labor for people. So at first, there's the fear and the thought, whatever's creeping in. Um, it even could be other people's fears and anxieties. Like maybe it's something that you're, that's coming up for you, but maybe your partner, there's something coming up for them and they're bringing that in the room because of something they say and then you're like, oh, that's right. Or maybe it's a look on someone's face in the room where you're like, oh, what's going on? Like, is something wrong? Is something bad? Is something happening? Um, it, it can be lots of different things, but once we see that and we feel that, then we start to hold tension in our body. So usually where that shows up is in the face somewhere. So maybe like tension in the jaw, maybe it's like crinkling our face, but maybe it's our shoulders. Sometimes a lot of times people hold tension here. Um, the, the problem is, is that when we're holding tension and all that up here, it just travels straight down to where we're trying to relax the most, which is straight down to the uterus area, our pelvic floor, which leads to our cervix, and we're, we're wanting all the action to take place so that we can um, get to the end and meet the baby. So the more we can stay loose up here, it's just gonna travel down and you're gonna stay loose down here and things are gonna open up and things are gonna progress at a quicker pace um, and it's going to stay in that realm of being uncomfortable and intense versus really, really painful. Um, when we, like, movies and TV and all of that are horrible depictions of labor and birth, absolutely horrible, but the thing is, the thing that they always show is the person is just like writhing in pain, screaming, freaking out, you know, just very panicked. Um, and if that was, if that were in real life, um, which has it happened? Sure, yeah, it's happened. People get to that point in labor. But if a person gets to that point, it's because of this. It's not because of anything else, it is because of this. It's because there's an anxiety or fear that's creeped in and they're holding tension in their body and they're so tight in their body that it's really painful and it's causing panic and it just is like this big snowball. Um, so that's, it's, you've got the tension and then you've got the increased pain. And then if that keeps going, it can actually just interrupt like the hormones that are trying to be produced in your body and it, it can, you know, can even stop labor sometimes depending on where labor's at. So it's really significant. Um, the main thing about labor, which we're going to talk about is staying relaxed keeping your body relaxed in every way that you can, except for this muscle that has to work. Um, the reason that I don't talk about labor being painful is because injuries are painful. Um, this is not an injury. This is your body just trying to do something. It's trying to get a baby out. And if we can allow that muscle to do its job and to work in the way that it's meant to, it's going to be more productive, it's going to be faster, and it's going to be more manageable all around. So the more that we can keep this out of, our, of the labor, the better. So one of the ways to do this, though, is like I said, to talk about it ahead of time. Have a conversation with your partner. Talk about what you're scared of. Sometimes people are like, I'm not scared of anything. I'm just really ready to birth this baby. I'm excited for labor. I'm excited to feel it but they might be scared of afterwards. They might be scared of delivering the placenta or bringing a baby home. Um, so it doesn't have to always relate to the actual labor itself. It can be anything in that you know, circle of, of feelings. Um, but talk to each other. And then for partners who are not going through pregnancy, see, this is the pizza. Sorry, <laughs> it's my children. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> yes, uh, I'll have them answer the door, I'm sorry. I'll have my son answer the door. Okay, okay. <laughs>
this happen last time? You, you called it. I talk them well. It. Don't answer the door for people you don't know. <laughs> <laughs> They're old. They're older. I gotta tell them. Okay. And she did. And it like texts them and be like, answer the door when the pizza gets there. <laughs> pizza leaves. I've had it happen. And, um, <laughs> that are not answering the door. <laughs> not just one, three. They must not be hungry. Oh my gosh, I didn't give them a warning. They what? paid for it still? No, I paid for it. So I ordered it, but I'm only because I know I should do that. Oh, well, there they are again. Hello? OK, just you can just leave the pizza at the door. Yeah, yeah, great. Okay. Nice. Great. <laughs> yeah. This is on video. Yes, it is. It's okay. We're gonna have yeah, it out. It's okay. Yeah. Like okay. Okay. Um, anyway, so talk about this as a couple. Talk about it with your birth team. If there's anything really significant, tell your midwife. They'll put it in the chart, and they're gonna really support you around those things. So like. If you're really nervous about pushing or tearing or pooping in labor, talk about it. Because the more you talk about it and we normalize it, um, it's going to be better. It, it really is. And then, like I said, if it does come up, it's going to be a lot quicker to move through it. Partners, it's really significant for you to know about this because if you start to see tension in your person that is in labor, notice it. Pay attention. Say something. You know, say, like, Hey, I'm noticing like you're seeming really tense. Like, are you okay? Like, can we do you want to talk through something? Or maybe it's just touching their shoulder and gently reminding them, oh, it's your muscles. Um, if their breathing's starting to change, breathe with them. You know, remind them to go back to that really calm breath. Um, the birth support people in the room are going to know all the things to do, but not like partners. Um, you're going to recognize tension in your partner even more so than the people supporting. So you, you do play a significant role in, in recognizing this stuff and just those gentle little reminders to release that. Um, and sometimes people need uh, reminders to release that literally every single contraction they have. And that's okay. That's okay. If that's what you need, um, then that's what you will get in terms of support. So. Does anybody have any fears that they want to voice in this class or talk about? Or like even questions that are like, do people really think in labor? I mean, things like that. These are the things that people want to hear about. So, anybody have any of that? Okay. Well, if you think of things, it, there's always time uh, in the whole class, so so don't hesitate to, to ask um, as we're moving through this. So we are going to start talking about the labor process and the stages of labor. Um, let's move on here. Oh, yeah, before we do this, I do, okay, just a really quick thing about birth affirmations. Super important. This is something that you can do ahead of time, so it's a fun little activity that you can do as you're waiting for your little baby to arrive. Um, so the birth affirmations um, are really helpful to even say them and be surrounded by them in these final weeks of pregnancy. Um, and then the other day I was at a birth and she, well actually I think someone had written a few affirmations down for her on cute little note cards and she had them around the room. And it was really, really sweet. and. Um, I think that it's helpful. I really do. I think it's good to be surrounded by some of these positive things, but you can also come up with your own. It does not have to be this long even. You could just do like one, one wave at a time. I know that was one from the other day that I liked, so that's really short and sweet. But you can use these if you want. You can make your own that really speak to you. Um, if there's certain things in your life like faith or something like that that um, is important to you. You can intertwine that into your birth affirmations and that can be helpful. So so I do encourage you to do these. Um, it doesn't have to be anything fancy, but it can be very, very helpful. 
Um, so signs that labor might be near. So as we start to talk about the early stage of labor, this is definitely something that people like to know. The really tricky thing about signs labor may be near is it very well may mean that it's not near because our body can just naturally start to do these things anyways as we get closer to the big day. What I always say about these is that if there's like two or three or more of them happening at the same time, that's more of a sign that labor might be like 24 or 48 hours away. If there's just one of these things happening, maybe, but probably not. But if there's two, three or more, then it's a possible sign of, of that early labor could be starting soon. So the one that I really like to, I mean, all of these are pretty explanatory, but the one that I like to focus on the most is the mucus plug because that is one that can really get tricky and people can be like, oh, what's my mucus plug labor is going to start. Yeah. Not really. Like it can, but let's talk about it for a minute. So the mucus plug is a protective mucusy plug that is um, in between your cervix and um, like the bag of water. So it, it's right now it's protecting and not allowing for things to get in there. But as your cervix starts to dilate and open up and things start changing, your mucus plug will start to come out. Um, now, just a plain old mucus plug is going to be like clear, sometimes greenish, sometimes yellowish. It can come out all at once and it's, you know, it's not pretty. It's kind of yucky, but <laughs> just so you know. Um, but it's, any, it's exactly what you think it would be like, okay? Just mucusy. Um, usually people notice it like once they go to the bathroom and they wipe and they're like, oh, wow, well, there's the mucus plug. Um, it also can come out in chunks. So like over a week or days, just losing little pieces of it. Um, definitely a sign that your body's getting ready for labor at some point, but you could lose your mucus plug weeks, like a couple weeks before labor starts. Now, the one difference though, is if you lose your mucus plug and you have some bloody show with it, which I hate the word bloody show. I just, <laughs> why? I'm like why? It doesn't have to be called that. I don't know. I. I but if there's some blood with the mucus, that is more of a sign that things could start happening in the next couple, like the next day or two. Um, anytime you have a little bit of bleeding like that, whether it's with your mucus plug or without, it means cervical change. Okay, so um, the cervix is full of capillaries. It's very sensitive as it softens. And so as it changes, you'll have some bleeding, and especially when early labor starts, usually people have some bleeding with that um, as well. So um, a little bit of bleeding is just fine. If it seems like a lot, always reach out um, to the midwife. They'll have you send a picture. Nothing's too TMI for the phones here. Um, and you know they'll let you know if it's too much or not. It probably isn't. But, um, but yeah, that's kind of the mucus plug. Um, Sometimes people don't lose it until they're far into their labor. So don't let that be, like, don't let that trip you up in your head where it's like, oh, well, I've lost my mucus plug. Like, I mean, it might be in my labor, but that hasn't happened yet. It doesn't matter. It can happen far into the labor process before, you know, for some people. So it's just for, for some people they lose it and some people they don't. Um, what I want to say about the bloody show, too, is that... Um, you can have a little bit of bleeding with things like sexual activity too. So sexual activity is great later in pregnancy, really good to help bring on labor and contractions um, because it creates oxytocin and um, that's what makes contractions happen. But with sexual activity, sometimes um, if it's around the cervix, then it can cause it to bleed a little bit because like I said, it's full of capillaries and if it's really soft and things are already starting to happen, which is likely to be the case after 36 weeks, then you might have a little bleeding after that and it is a-okay um, if that happens, but it doesn't mean labor's near. It just means that the cervix got a little bit disrupted and is bleeding a little bit. So that's why I say it's more about having two or three of these symptoms. So, um, so yeah, hopefully that's helpful. Um, 
sometimes people don't have any of this and they just go right into labor too. So um, it, it's just good little tidbit of information to have, but it's not the end all be all when we're looking, you know, because a lot of times people don't have any of it and labor just starts. So, um, so we're going to start talking about early labor. Um, and as we start thinking about that, I also want to talk about what's happening in your body once labor starts. Now, some of this stuff starts happening at the end of pregnancy naturally, because your body is just getting ready. People are not starting labor with a hard cervix that's, that's not, you know, ripened and ready to go. So your body is doing something as you're leading up to it. Now, for some people, that might mean that they're two, three, four centimeters dilated when they go into labor. Sometimes they're zero. It doesn't matter. Um, even if you're zero, maybe you're really thinned out and just really soft. So any progression of your cervix is, is great. Um, and it's really only a couple of pieces of the puzzle when it comes to labor progression. But for your cervix, so right now for most of you, some of you might have started to have some softening happen in your cervix, but for a lot of you, it's probably still pretty firm, really high up, and you know, not a lot's happening. But as things start to happen, what, ha is the, what starts to happen is the cervix starts to, it softens first, then it starts to dilate, and it starts to efface or shorten and thin. So these are some words that you might hear in your labor um, if you decide to, to get cervical checks or a cervical check. Um, now, the really interesting thing about the cervix is this stuff can start to happen even before your cervix moves forward to be in front of the baby's head. So the cervix can start to make these changes, but the cervix can still be actually behind the baby's head, which is super interesting. Um, so even if your baby's really low and engaged in your pelvis, the cervix could still be back here and it has to move forward and labor is doing that. As your, your uterus is contracting, it's also moving that cervix forward. It's a big part of it, big part of the puzzle. Once it moves forward and baby's head can apply that nice pressure on the cervix, then we start to see more of this. Um, and we start to see kind of like that more active labor um, start to happen. So the cervical dilation is from zero to 10. The effacement is zero to 100. Um, obviously 110 is the goal. And so basically the cervix that you have like melts away, which is really intriguing that our body can do that. Um, but if you were to get a cervical check, these are the things they talk about, like effaced or thinning out and then the centimeters. Now, this is a diagram of the centimeters. So this is one and this is 10. Isn't that crazy? Like inside there, it's this big and open, which makes sense, right? Because the baby's head has to fit through there. Um, so just so you know how they do it, I think this is good info to have. Um, when they do a cervical check, they're using their fingers, not their whole hand, just their fingers, and they use these two fingers, right? So this one is just what, it's a number one, and it's what we call uh, a fingertip, like a fingertip dilated, because that's literally like all they can fit there is a fingertip. And then a one is when they can like fit a finger in and kind of move it around a little bit. And then a two, like they, then they can get two fingers in there. And then as they start going, they keep going, they literally like are feeling the cervix and spreading their fingers like this. And that's how they gauge how dilated you are, which is really amazing that they can do that. So, and obviously a 10, oh, 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 they're, they're feeling around in there to make sure, sure the cervix, cervix is all gone. And they're not doing this so much, but they're like feeling around to make sure they don't feel any cervix left. So then that person, you know, would be close to pushing. So that's, that's cervical dilation. Um, and then the other piece too that your body is doing is moving the baby down, which is also a ginormous piece of labor. So the cervix is very important and vital, but so is your baby moving down because they have to go down and out. Um, now, as you can see there, it says 41 weak fetus in vertex position, which vertex is head down, engaged at minus two. So 
we hear at our appointments, like they might feel for your baby's head and be like, oh, the baby's very low, the baby is engaged in your pelvis, which is great, good news. Now, for first time parents, engagement in the pelvis is super common to happen at some point in pregnancy. That's when we also hear things like, oh, has your baby dropped? Oh, yeah, it's dropped, it's engaged in the pelvis. Um, baby low, ba baby's low, baby's dropped, things like that. Um, if this is not your first baby, it's actually very common for babies not to engage in the pelvis even until labor. They can and they might, but if they don't, don't get worried about it. That's something that absolutely can happen in labor. But what's very interesting to me is we hear the word engaged and we're like, oh sweet, my baby's super low. They are low, but they've got a lot of room to go. So like negative two, that's a big, like that saying it's negative two and engaged. Negative two is still very, very high when we're talking about labor. So you might hear words um, like that in your labor. The midwife might say something like, Oh, yeah, you know, you're this and this with your cervix and baby's at a minus one or a minus two or a minus three. Um, that means baby's still pretty high. Minus one is getting closer. But even like, and it's literally like the tiniest little increments that baby has to move down. But if you're in labor and baby's up there, that means that we're doing some work to get baby to move lower. We're doing things like lunges and squats and things to get baby to move down because we want baby, um, once you're in like active labor and you're at like five, six, seven centimeters, we want baby at least at a zero is, is ideal. Plus one's even better, but zero is, is a great place to be as we get into that really active labor. Um, but it takes work. It really does take work. And this is one of the big things that your body is doing um, in labor, aside from all that cervical dilation and, and effacement and all of that. So the reason that I want, I, I, I want you guys to know about this is because sometimes we can get really caught up in the numbers. So like if you come here and let's say you want to be assessed in labor and they're like, oh, well, you know, you're doing great, you're a three and you're 70% of face, but it's time, you know, you should go home and you'll come back in a little bit. I don't want you to get hung up around that because your body's doing a lot of other work too, like moving your baby down. So you could be at a three, but your baby could be at a zero. You know, so there's lots of pro different progress being made. So don't get worried if you hear some of those numbers. Um, so once your contractions start, um, what's it, what it's going to feel like, I think the best way to describe it is... Um, like menstrual cramping is, is really probably the best um, way to describe that sensation, but it's menstrual cramping along with that tightening. So if you guys have felt, has everybody felt Braxton Hicks before? Not yet. Some people won't um, ever feel them. I, I bet you're having them, but you're not feeling them. Um, because it, sometimes it can be hard to recognize. But if you do know what a Braxton Hicks contraction feels like, or if you don't yet, maybe you will at some point, it's that tightening of your uterus and the, that menstrual cramp feeling. And it's going to come and go, which is the beauty of contractions and the beauty of labor is it comes and goes so you get a break. Um, usually it's going to start out pretty mild. So you'll be like, oh, well, that felt different. Um, I felt breast and hicks before, but now I'm feeling this other sensation too. Um, and you'll just recognize it. And in early labor, Usually, um, it's very mild, very manageable, and usually they're spaced out pretty far apart, or there's just no pattern. Maybe you have like one every 10 minutes, then 20, then 15, then 7, then 5, and then it goes back to 10. It can be all over the place. We're looking for a really solid pattern, um, but, and so when they're all over the place, or if they're really, maybe they are in a pattern, but they're every 15 minutes or something like that, that's very, very early labor, and it's just something to notice. It's something to notice in your mind, like, huh, something's happening, something's different, let's see where this goes. It might turn into labor and progress to active labor, it might not. You might have a little bit of this sensation of early labor, and then it might stop and come back tomorrow. 
Um, sometimes, you know, it, it might come back every day around the same time for a couple of hours and then one day, boom, there it is. And it, it keeps going and it doesn't stop. But it really does look different for everybody. Um, Contractions are literally like waves. That's why sometimes people will call them waves or surges because they start at this low line level and then they creep up to a peak and then they come down. Um, usually when in early labor, when they start, they're about 30 seconds long, which is great. We're aiming for at least a minute long, but in that early stage, 30 seconds is great and that's really normal. Um, as things intensify and become, um, you know, just you have to focus through and, and really uh, breathe through them and things like that, I want you always to come back to this and remember that it's a wave and that once it hits the peak, the most intense part of that 30 minute or 30 second or one minute contraction, once it hits the very hardest part, it immediately starts coming down, which is so amazing. So when it feels really, really hard, I want you to remember that, and I want partners to remember to remind your person of that too, that it's just hard this, at that very top, and then it's gonna start coming down, and then you get this beautiful break in between, which is what makes it manageable. It, it's it, what literally what makes labor manageable. I, it wouldn't be manageable otherwise. Um, if you are, so once you do decide to time these, now about timing, in early labor, there's literally no reason to time it. it. You recognize it, you're like, okay, yep, this is happening, but you don't need to time your contractions. Um, there's really no reason to do that. Now, once it changes and feels different, maybe they're starting to get close together, sure, start timing them. Um, time them for an hour, see, see where it's at, and then stop timing them. There's no reason to time them for hours and hours on end. Now, sometimes partners really like to time contractions, and if that gives them a job that they makes them very happy, great. <laughs> yeah, they totally can do that. It, it really can feel like a, a nice little activity for them to do. Um, and if that makes them feel better, great. They can keep doing it. But for partners, if you do want to do that, just keep it your own little project. You don't need to share the information freely all the time. Just have it be your little private thing that you're like, oh, this is kind of cool. Um, also, if you're deciding to be the timer, get you got to get really good at recognizing when they start and finish because you don't want to be like, did it finish? You know, you don't. You just got to kind of like. Get, get in the groove and recognize when that's happening so you don't have to ask those questions. Um, but in the early stage, there's really no reason to do that. Now, there's a lot of apps that are out there that are fantastic for this. And what one do you use? It's, it's called Storky. Storky. Yeah, it's a free one. Yeah, and you the free ones are great. Yes, because all it is is just kind of, again, timing it. Just press right. a button and then it shows you like a list too, which is kind of helpful. Yeah. yeah. And you can like take screenshots and send it to the midwife or mm -hmm. if you want, or your doula, if you have a doula. Who has a doula in here? I just thought I'd be asking. Sweet. Okay. So, but yes, uh, the apps are great. Now, sometimes people want to be really um, on it and they want to do it themselves and create, actually create spreadsheets. <laughs> I think that's hard to do. Okay, but if you are, that's okay. And so what you would do is you want to, when you start timing, use time from the beginning of one contraction to the beginning of the next contraction, okay? So, I know, right? Did you know that? Well, I knew that was like the start and finish, but when you're actually timing on one of the timers, you do start and end. Well, right? the timer does it for you. Mm -hmm. So like the timer calculates that for you, but mm -hmm. if you were just using a stopwatch, oh, right, then right. you have to you're figure that out. Watch. Right, right. And so it gets a little more complicated. Um, so that's why the apps are really, really great. So, But if you are doing it yourself, it's from the beginning of one to the beginning of the next. Um, yeah, so... That's just some info about contractions. Do you guys have any questions about any of that? No. Okay, all right, cool. All right, so let's talk about the early stage of labor. So all of the stages of labor obviously are very important, but 
I personally think the early stage is the most important. The reason why I think it's the most important is specifically when long labors come into play. And for a first time person, the average labor, statistically, is around 24 hours, right? So I know that sounds long, but a big piece of that is early labor. So early labor on average is around 10 to 12 hours. Um, so in that 24, so 10 to 12 is pretty manageable. Um, but I think the thing is about the 24 hour stating that is sometimes it can actually be a lot longer than that. Sometimes early labor can last a really long time. And even though it's manageable, people get excited and they start doing all these things to get things going and they're excited and they're maybe doing you know lots of walks and showers and getting ready and all these things. And really what you should be doing is just eating, drinking, and resting. Well, that is it. And ignoring as much as you can. Like ignore it for as long as you can and then once you have to start thinking about it, eat, drink, rest. That is it, nothing else. I promise you your label will start when it's ready to. Um, when your body feels, feels ready to move into that different space. So hormones and labor, what's happening? So these are the main hormones that are surging through except Adrenaline, we don't want that one. Um, but the other three are just surging through your body, and the more that we can bring those hormones on, the better. That's going to help get those contractions stronger and closer together and shift you into active labor. So oxytocin is number one. That is oxytocin is what causes contractions. That's that. Um, in the hospital, if you guys have ever heard of Pitocin, um, Pitocin is a synthetic form of oxytocin, and so that's why they give it to people to induce labor in the hospitals, because that's what it does. Um, so, but the natural form of that is oxytocin, and um, it is truly the labor of, or the hormone of love. So, love helps that hormone flourish. So, lots of cuddles kissing, just being close to each other is going to be great um, for labor and just feeling loved um, is, is going to be good. Endorphins, well actually I'm going to talk about melatonin first. Um, melatonin works with the oxytocin kind of hand in hand. Melatonin is when you when we, we think about like, oh we want the room to be darker and quiet, not a lot of talking and questions and interruptions. That's because we're wanting to encourage the release of the melatonin, which releases, helps release the more oxytocin, okay? So, really, really important. Now, as in early labor, those dark, the dark room and all of that, that's not as important because things are so mild, but as things intensify and get closer together, that's when we want to think about things like dimming the lights, um, quiet voices, soft music is fine. Sometimes people like really crazy music and that's okay too. It's whatever it's, you're comfortable with. But quiet, you know, tends to bring this on a little bit better. Um, sensitive to interrupt interruptions and observations. So that's what I mean about like the timing. So once things are intensifying, if you're just like pushing a button and you're just like watching and you're asking questions like, how was that one? Did that hurt? Was that hard? No, don't, don't do any questions like that because what that does is it brings that person out of where their body is trying to be, which is in this labor land place. Um, when these hormones start surging through our bodies and things intensify and get closer together, our right brain starts to shut down and we want it to shut down as much as, as possible. We want the left brain to completely take over um, and allow you to sit in this place. When people are asking questions and um, there's lots of interruptions, it ignites that right part of our brain. It's like, oh, yep, gotta wake that up because I need to answer this question and I need to be on it. And so some of these things can get lessened. Um, endorphins, so those are really important. It's natural pain relief. So anything that we can do to help encourage endorphins is great. So like it says up there, soft touch, massage, again, just feeling loved and supported. Um, if you like the soft touch, like soft touch on your arms or on your back, that 
creates endorphins, and that's helpful. If you don't like that, obviously it doesn't. Don't do that. Um, <laughs> it'll just irritate you. Um, massage might be nice, though. And laughter is great. It just really lightens everything up. Um, laughter can actually cause quite a bit of progression. Um, so can crying, too. Just any release of big emotions can be helpful to bring all of these um, uh, hormones out. Now, laughter, I mean, not everybody laughs their whole labor. I have seen it where people are just very joyful throughout, and they're just laughing. I don't see that that often. Um, there comes a point usually in labor where the jokes are just not funny anymore. Um, so if you do make your partner laugh, and that's like a thing in your relationship, bring it on, make them laugh, but then once they start to get irritated at the little things, no more. You know, we'll just turn that off until later. Um, but that's, that actually is a really great sign when the, when things aren't funny anymore. It's a really great sign that things are shifting into a new place where they're just like, don't talk to me anymore. Like, no more. Um, so don't get your feelings hurt if they start to say things like that. It's actually a really, really good sign that things are shifting. So, yeah. All right. Oh, and the adrenaline. I should talk about that really quick. So adrenaline is what comes in when I talk about that fear, tension, pain cycle. So when that happens, adrenaline comes creeping in and it puts the kibosh on all these other things. So it's just like, boom, no more endorphins for you. It's not going to feel good. Like that's when we're starting to feel more pain. Um, it can actually um, cause labor to stop. So if you've ever heard stories, maybe it, maybe it's happened to you or maybe someone that you know where they went to a hospital or somewhere to give birth and their labor completely stopped. The reason that happens is because they were in this place, maybe at home, I'm assuming, where they felt safe and happy and supported. And so their body's like, okay, yeah, we're in this place. That's really good. And we're at labor starting. And then they get in the car and they go to the hospital or somewhere else. And it's earlier in labor probably. That's typically when that happens. And they get to that. Usually it's a hospital. It's just, I mean, it is. They get to the hospital and all these questions are coming out. Bright lights and all this stuff. And their body's just like, whoa, whoa. Like, nope. I'm not safe anymore. I don't feel safe. I don't feel comfortable anymore. And so labor either significantly slows down and has to get ramped up again, or it can stop altogether. So that's why is because of, of the adrenaline. So like animals, if animals start to feel a lot of adrenaline, adrenaline and they don't feel safe while they're in labor, their, their labor absolutely does stop, and they it stops completely, and they have to move and find a new place where they feel safe and then their body releases again and they're able to, to birth their new babies. So it, it, it's very significant to know the role that that, uh, that hormone plays or can play in labor. So, all right, um, let's see what's next here. Okay, position. So <clears throat> when you're at home and you know, you're at first you're ignoring everything, you're just kind of doing something fun. Maybe you're watching your favorite show, maybe you're watching a movie, bake a cake, clean the floors, I don't know what it is, but you're just not paying attention to this little labor that is starting in your body. But there is going to come a time where it will get significant. You will have to stop and breathe, maybe close your eyes, and try some of these positions. Um, I know that this graphic is old, okay? I can't find a better one that has all of these on it, so I just always come back to this. I've spent hours searching for one that's not from 1982, <laughs> but I don't know. This is a good one. So a lot, a lot of these are great. Um, these are positions that you can use at home. These are positions that you'll definitely use here at the birth center. Um, some of them are on a ball, and I'm going to show you. I'm going to get off the ball and show you a couple things on that. Um, I'll tell you my favorites on here. So I love the lunging. This is good. This is hip opener. Um, and it's going to help baby just shift and move. I really like all the forward leaning positions. Those are great. Um, they're a little bit more restful too. Um, I like the squatting positions a lot. Those are also really good positions to get baby in a lower spot. Can you guys see? 
Um, to get baby in a lower spot and just open up the, the, your hips and your pelvis and get things moving. Um, when you're doing any squatting positions, one thing that's really important to remember is to have flat feet, okay? Super important um, because if we're squatting and we have feet like this, everything's tight. So like all the, these muscles are tight because I'm having to hold myself up. But when they're flat, I'm actually able to like really release and relax into this position. So you can squat on your own like this if you want to, but it's also, I think it's nicer to have someone supporting you. One of my very, very favorites is this one right here. So, you know, like your partner would be like this on a chair and then you would be down here squatting and using their legs for support. Um, I really love that. So it's very connective and, and nice. I also like um, this one. This and this um, is a dangling squat. So you're putting a lot of weight on your partner. Um, just so you're still in that squatting position, but not all of that weight's on your legs because it can get tiring. When you are doing things like squatting and lunging and in those more active positions or stairs, stairs are super, super good too. Um, you don't have to do them forever, you know, just do them till your legs get tired and then move to something else. Um, but do them a few times. Now, also, when you are doing a lunge or a squat, you're doing it during a contraction. That's a very important part of this. So, because it works with your contraction, right? Because your body's contracting, moving baby down, and you're also in this position where your hips are open and your pelvis is open. So it's going to be more productive if you're doing it during a contraction. So like for squatting, bless you, um, when you feel that contraction starting, like maybe you're moving around and you're swaying, um, something like that, and then you know you're going to squat, you start to feel that contraction. Before it gets too intense, you move into your squat and you stay there until the contraction is over. Whatever position you're doing during a contraction is you need to stay there because it's going to feel terrible to move out of it during the contraction. So you want to stay right there until it's over and then you'll move around and do something. Um, movement in general is great in labor. So literally just walk here in your house. If it's nice enough outside, bundle up. If it's a little cold, get some fresh air, take a walk outside. Um, they'll usually come a point where outside doesn't feel good because you want to be like in your space. You want to be enclosed. You don't want to be like exposed to the world. Um, but when it does still feel okay, that's a nice thing to do. Um, you want to balance out active things with restful things. So once it gets, you get to the point where labor, this is happening and things are intensifying and you're having to move and breathe and, and all of that, um, rotate in between one hour of active and one hour of restful. That's kind of the like balance that I like to keep in mind when I'm supporting someone. So restful things, laying in bed on your side, if that feels okay. Um, if you are laying in bed on your side, try to balance that out on the other side too. So maybe spend like 10, 15, 20 minutes on one side and then the next side, spend some time doing that. <coughs> Um, on the other side because you want to balance out your body. Um, it also helps balance out cervical dilation because if you're laying on your side and your body's contracting, work's still being done and baby's still moving. And if you're on one side, it can put pressure on your cervix on that one side. And then if you don't do the other side, it can be a little uneven. So it's good to balance it out. Um, being in the tub is a great, relaxed, um, restful place to be. Um, you know, even some of the, like, this is restful, this is restful, this is restful. You know, anywhere at time that you're resting your body. Um, active things are going to be walking around, doing stairs, squats, lunges, things like that. Um, <coughs> you are doing the stairs if you have stairs in your house. The best thing to do is to do, like, try and skip a step. So like, <coughs> if this is a step, like skip a step and kind of lunge. And then you'll do the next step and you'll do the next leg and you'll lunge like this. And you'll just keep doing that as you're going up the stairs. 
And then when you come down the stairs, you'll just go down the stairs like normal, <coughs> but it's going up that's more productive. So stairs are great. And if you're like, once you're here, you can use our stairs too. If it's, I mean, you can during a clinic day, but <laughs> we do have back stairs actually that you can use. Um, but yeah, these are just some options. And then I want to show you the ball. So if you don't have a ball at home, like I said, that's okay. Um, we obviously have them here for when you are here. And this ball is very small. Um, so, but when you have a ball at home, you want it to be big enough to where your knees are at a 90 degree angle. Okay, that's important. Um, this, like bouncing on a ball, I mean, it feels fine, but this is not gonna do anything for you in labor. Um, what, where the ball comes in handy in labor is doing big hip circles. So big circles around, and you wanna go the other way too. And these are just good things to, to do. And do it for as long as you want to, as long as it feels good. Eventually, once you're at the birth center, the ball will eventually not feel good as your baby gets lower because of all the pressure. But um, until then, it's a great tool. Um, the other thing you can do is figure eights, which I always have to really I know, about. it does take time. But, oh, well, these are like kind of fast. But when <laughs> I was at a labor the other day, and she was going so slow through the figure eights, and it really was super helpful. It, it brought things on. So, um, yeah, ball's great. And, um, yeah, just another thing. Oh, the other thing that I liked about the ball, too, is you can also use it, like, if you're on hands and knees, instead of putting the pressure on your wrists, you can lean over the ball like this. When it feels good. <laughs> um, and you can bring it on your bed too. So if you are wanting to do hands and knees on the bed and you just need a little bit of leverage, you can stack up pillows if you want to, but also just bring the ball on the bed. You can put a blanket over it to make it more cozy and it feels really, really good. So it's definitely something they do here. Are there peanut balls here too? Yes, we do have peanut balls. Um, so for those of you that don't know, so a peanut ball is like that, but it's shaped like a peanut. Um, it's, you can use it for what I was just showing you, like being on that hands and knees and like lean over it. It's also something that we use, um, in, like we'll put it in between someone's legs if they're resting on, this, on their side in bed. It can be a really great tool to use in labor for that. So, but these are just some ideas. And when you do start early labor and you're needing some position ideas, pull this out and just kind of work through whatever ones speak to you. Um, counter pressure. So counter pressure is super important to know about. Um, usually once someone starts needing to work through their contractions, that's maybe when counter pressure starts to feel good. Once counter pressure does start to feel good, usually it feels good until the very end. So for partners, if you start using counter pressure, just know if they <laughs> like it, they like it, they're gonna like it every time then, which is good. Just keep at it, keep doing it. If you have a doula, you guys can take turns, of course. Um, but at home, this is a very good tool um, to have in your pocket. So the counter pressure, um, this one, this person is applying pressure like basically on the person's sacrum. So you want to use this part of your hand. Um, you can use that whole palm of your hand. Um, that, that can be really, really helpful. And how you find it. And I want to say too, this can be used in any position. Hands and knees, leaning up against the wall, leaning over a table, a couch, uh, on their side. Like you can pretty much do this anywhere that a person is. Um, it's going to be a lot of pressure. And this is another one where communication is super important. So if you're enjoying that counter pressure, tell your partner, yep, that's it, that feels good, just that much. Or nope, a little bit more, a little bit more, you know, and so that they can get an idea of how much pressure to put on your back and keep doing that every time. So for partners, once you do start doing that, same amount of pressure every time, so you just kind of get in the groove of that, you want to keep that pressure on your partner's back until the contraction's over. Very important, because if you release that in the middle of a contraction, it's going to feel terrible to them. Um, so it's really important to start right at the beginning and wait until the end. Um, and if you find that communication's helpful, you know, like the person in labor can be like, 
oh yeah that's good I'm done um, and sometimes I even need that sometimes like sometimes people are such quiet little birthers that <laughs> I need a little bit of help because I'm like wow um, so anyway so how you find that is where's the bones here so when you're putting um, your hand on the person's back, like you can feel for that tailbone, and that's great, but you actually want to go a little higher than that. So you feel for it, find your spot, and then go higher, and just push firmly with your whole hand on their back. Um, the next counter pressure move is, is, not that, is this, um, the double hip squeeze. So both are great, um, and they feel good for different reasons. Um, as the baby moves down and things are shifting, the pelvis is, everything's opening up, it can feel good to almost be like, it feels like you're gonna be put back together because things are opening. Um, and so just holding you together feels good. Um, I recently got the question from one of the couples I was working with, the, the dad was like, oh, but if I do too much pressure, will that like, hinder the baby coming down. And I'm like, no, you are not that powerful. Um, <laughs> no, it just feels good. So don't worry about that. Uh, things are still happening. It just it just feels really good. So um, notice this person's hands on the back, though, and how they're formed, right? Like how they're shaped on that person's back. So they're like this. Um, yeah, that's right. Um, that's going to give you kind of more leverage and so when i'm doing it like i do have to kind of like lean in and, and uh kind of bend over to get in the right spot again you can do that double hip squeak, squeeze pretty much in any position that they're in you really can as long as you can get a hold of the hips so you just want to find the hips and when you find that like crevice of the hips you want to kind of push in and up mm -hmm. and they're going to tell you what feels good and what doesn't how much pressure all of that um, and again, just keep doing it until the very end. But both of those counter pressure modes are, are really, really important and, and great. Um, all right, so, I don't know, we're not gonna do that. We're not at the yet, whatever. We'll get there. So for early labor too, some things that are worth mentioning. One is, cervical dilation usually is like zero, you know, wherever you're starting, wherever that is until like a six they, they now call active labor a six so you're doing all of that work um until active labor and then once active labor kicks in you're, it's okay you can sit at home unless it's your second baby you can sit at home <laughs> for a little while and and hang out there's no rush to get here um you'll have plenty of time here but you know, it, it means things are happening, things are closer, and it's time to call the midwife, it's time to touch base and start talking about a plan. Now, the reason I say not if it's your second baby is because, number one, usually for second babies, there's not as much early labor, usually, and everybody's different, and I'm not going to promise that to you, but most of the time. Um, and so then, once you really start feeling that active labor, things are kicking in, contractions are five minutes apart, lasting for a minute, for a, an hour, maybe even less than that, it's time to come in, especially if you have a little bit of a drive, um, because we don't want you to spend your most, the most intense time of your labor in the car. So you're coming in, if, who's second? That's your second baby? Yours? Yours? Or no, your second. Wait, your first. Okay, so you three. <laughs> And it's second for all of you, right? Yeah. So yeah, so second babies in particular are um, typically faster. So you'll come up with that plan with the midwife. But what I'm about to talk about, where we're hanging out at home as long as possible and all of that, that doesn't really apply to you. Um, unless your labor looks like that, which it probably won't. But so just keep that in mind as I'm sharing this, this bit of information. So um, once, I'm just keeping an eye on the time because of the break, because of your camera. Yeah. Well, I don't know what time we're at right now. 7.20. Okay. Yeah. We'll take a break here in just, just like 10 minutes. Um, as contractions are getting closer together, um, once they hit that every five minute space, usually, not every time, but usually that means things are intensifying, it's getting closer. Um, 
your contraction still could be 30 seconds in duration or in length. So the five minutes, yes, while it's significant, that one minute long is also very, very significant. So we also want that piece, it's super important. So once you're noticing this, um, it's like, huh, yeah, these are getting closer together. Yes, time them. This is where a timer um, for partners comes in handy. Time them, see what happens in an hour. And if they're in a nice solid pattern for an hour, that's great. What that means for you, if this is your first baby, is that things are getting closer to active labor. Okay, you're probably not quite there yet, but you're getting close. Um, and it's good, that's exciting and, and really helpful. You can then put the timer away if you'd like to, you don't have to, but if you'd like to, you can. And just keep going, keep doing the things that I just talked about. Remember to rest, eat, drink. Um, you want to eat as much as you can in the early stage because eventually your appetite is going to decrease a lot. We'll still have you taking bites of food, and I'm gonna talk about that, but in this early stage is usually when people can still eat a meal um, or something more significant. So the more energy and calories you can get in your body during that early stage, the better. Really keep up on your water. Um, electrolyte drinks are great. Gatorade, Powerade are perfect. Liquid IV, wonderful. If you do a couple packs of those in your labor, that's going to be super helpful. There's so many brands of that stuff out there, and they're, I, I mean, I don't have a favorite. A lot of them are just fine, um, but, but it is really good, that really heavy electrolyte drink. Um, coconut water is my favorite. Um, that's a really good one. It's all natural, and it's got natural electrolytes in it, which is why I love it. So that is great if you love it. Um, not, not everybody does. Um, there's a Labor Aid recipe in your packet of info if you want to make that, and it's pretty tasty. Um, but keep up on those liquids. My kind of general rule of thumb is taking a drink after every contraction. So instead of like gulping, gulping, like you don't have to do that. It might upset your tummy, it might not. But um, just a drink after every contraction is great. This is another really nice job for partners to just be the one. Be like, hey, do you want a drink? Do you want a drink? Because the person in labor is not going to remember that all the time. Um, so, so that's good for you to remind, remind her of that. Um, so, but your contractions are five minutes apart where it's getting more intense. You're definitely having to breathe through them at this point and close your eyes and kind of go into that place. Now, if this is your second baby, five minutes apart, I'm just going to say this again, is it's definitely time to call the midwife and time to be thinking about going in because they're five minutes apart lasting for a minute, okay? First time families, still fine to stay home, we're actually looking for every three minutes, okay? So every three minutes lasting for a minute for a whole hour. Now, usually it means that your body is definitely shifting into active labor and getting closer, which is great. It's, it's, it's a good place to be. Now, there's other things that come into this, though. So everybody's labor looks different. I really, truly wish that I could get up here and just be like, this is what labor looks like, and I can't. It, it's the most frustrating thing about teaching childbirth ed because I've seen so many births in 15 years and not one of them has been the same. Not one. Now, straight, I call them like straightforward births. Like, oh, that was a really straightforward birth. And it kind of went through the exact stages that I'm talking about. And when I'm at a birth like that, it's like, sweet, that was really cool. Um, most of the time, there's a variable in there that is not perfectly straightforward. There's something that was different. Um, so when I say the three-minute rule, I say it a little bit loosely because sometimes people can be having contractions that are three minutes apart for hours at home and it's still not time to come to the birth center. So if you call the midwife and you're like, hey, contractions are every three minutes, lasting for a minute, I'm having to breathe through. Usually it's partners calling at this point because things are super intense. The midwife's going to ask questions like, okay, what does that person seem like? Are they having to breathe? Are they making sounds? Are they talking a lot still? Like, what's their demeanor like? And these questions are really significant. And sometimes when they get those, the midwife gets those answers, they say, great, you're still doing really good. Stay at home and let's touch base in a few more hours unless this, this, or this happens. So don't get discouraged if that happens. They're really 
protecting you, honestly, um, because they're keeping you in your home base, your home space, so that things can continue to progress. Um, one of the key things with with active labor and this three minute every three minute contraction rule, one of the biggest pieces how the person is acting. So if they are just in like completely in labor land and then just kind of like a different space in general and they're making lots of noises and things like that, yeah, the, the midwife is probably going to be like, all right, you know, yeah, you probably should come in. Let's meet at the birth center in an hour or something like that. Um, so, but, but that is a big piece of it. And so that's important to remember. Now, once you do start vocalizing, most people vocalize, just so you know, not everybody. Um, I've definitely seen silent birthers, but I, I probably can count on one hand how many times I've seen it. It's, it's not very common. Um, but vocalization is a pretty big indicator that things are really intensifying and probably heading into active labor or inactive labor. So when we talk about vocalization, the thing to remember is to keep your sounds low. So what I mean by low is like, uh, and because when I make that sound, what I feel in my body is relaxed. Everything feels relaxed. Um, if I'm like, ah, that doesn't feel relaxed. That's very tense. That feels scared, anxious, um, and yeah just the opposite of what we're going for. So for partners, if you start hearing her make those sounds that sound more high pitched or more scared or tense, remind your person to go back into the uh, low sounds, low sounds, low sounds. And sometimes again, people need that reminder every time. Remember your low sounds, remember your low sounds. And they'll switch back into it. Um, so it, those low sounds, it's, it just helps with opening up, it helps with relaxing, and it's, it's super, super important. So um, just a good little reminder of that. And then usually once people do start vocalizing, they just continue to vocalize throughout the rest of their labor until um, their baby's born. Sometimes people feel scared of vocalizing. They're afraid that they're going to be too loud. I've had countless people apologize, like, I'm sorry, I was so loud. No, do not ever apologize. The rooms downstairs are pretty soundproof. Um, if someone's super, super vocal, like yes, you will probably hear them. It, and it doesn't matter. Like this is a birth center and you can be as loud as you want to be. So do not ever, ever feel bad about making sounds. It's very, very normal. Um, so, but yeah, that is kind of early labor. And then the next thing we're gonna talk about is active labor, but before we do that, Go to the bathroom. Get some water if you want to get some water. Move your body. These chairs get so uncomfortable after that. So, and then we'll just come back in like five minutes or so. Um, active labor, like I said, you'll, you'll do some of your active labor at home if this is your first. Um, and then you'll start making your way to the birth center at some point. Um, the car ride. The lovely car ride. So everybody talks about it. It's, it is uncomfortable. Um, things to think about for the car, one, um, something to put on the seat in case your water breaks. Um, and on that topic of water breaking, I'll just sneak this in there. It's pretty rare for your water to break before labor starts it, it, as like a signifier of labor. Um, that's, a lot of people think that. A lot of people think like, oh, when my water breaks, then my labor will start. It's actually... Um, opposite of that. Usually your water will break closer to pushing or even during pushing um, or at least sometime in active labor. Pretty rare for it to happen in early labor or pre-labor. Um, pre um, and also I will say that when water breaks before labor starts, usually it's because of the position of the baby um, and not because your body's actually ready to go into labor. So a lot of times when that happens for people, you have to do some things to get labor going. Um, sometimes bodies will just go into labor within that first 24 hours if the water is broken, but not every time, and then we have to do some things to get it going. Um, but it's not the natural progression of things. So, um, But if you're in the car, you want to have something on the seat just in case it does break because it is hard to get all of that lovely amniotic fluid out of the seats. Um, and it's not ideal. So 
that and then something something to throw up in if you get sick in the car so being nauseous in labor is really common um, and sometimes the movement of the car and just like so much going on um, people can get they can feel sick so bring a little bag in the car um, or something like that and then also while you're in the car um, if you have a longer does anybody have a long drive from like 30 so, minutes yeah it's like 30 yeah. 30 40. okay anybody else got that long Depending yeah. On traffic. yeah which is totally fine but it can be uncomfortable so sometimes you have to get into a different position in the car you don't have to but it can feel nice if you're open to it so if you're open to getting on like hands and knees in the back seat go for it um, obviously if it's snowing or something like that don't do that um, <laughs> but I have seen a lot of people do that and it can feel better than just sitting in the seat in the front with your seatbelt on. Um, but just breathe. Um, that's the big thing is just breathe, get through it. Um, what makes the car uncomfortable is number one, sitting, because that doesn't feel good when we're in active labor. Um, and then the bumps. The bumps do not feel good. The stopping and the starting and the bumping, it's, it's really terrible. Um, and your partner probably will be very vocal about to the drivers I'm talking to <laughs> they're gonna be very vocal and like <laughs> stop don't go don't go too fast go faster don't hit bumps it's because it's 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 uncomfortable so do the best you can um, during the driving and you'll do great and then you'll get here and it always feels so so good um, to be at the birth center um, obviously the goal once you're here is to stay here that's what we want to but like I said sometimes People get sent back home. If you do get sent back home, don't get discouraged. Oftentimes, if you do get back home, things just ramp right back up and you're back here before you know it. Um, but it does happen sometimes. So it's never our goal for that to happen. Um, and it's definitely never your goal either. Now, if the roads are really, really bad and you're here and you've had a bit of a drive and you're in labor, Sometimes they'll have you stay for a little bit to kind of see how things are going, um, to see if things pick up. Um, so they are very mindful of different scenarios, just know that. Um, upon arrival, when you get here, they're going to take your blood pressure, they're going to listen to baby, and just let you be here. Um, they're going to let you just, you just kind of want to make yourself at home. Um, you can wear whatever you want. One of the questions that I always ask my people that I'm supporting is, what's your modesty level? So how do you feel with others in the room? Um, some people are like, I don't care. Like, I'll just be naked or whatever. I, I, you know, they're not bothered by it. Um, and that's fine. We're very used to that here. But if you are more of a modest, modest person, think about what you want to wear in labor. Um, sometimes people want to be more covered. <coughs> Other times... People maybe just want to be covered on top. Um, there's no right or wrong. It's really just what you're feeling. I think robes are great um, because you can take them on or off, especially like if you're in the water. Um, that can feel nice once you get out. You can just easily put something back on. <coughs> I think I'm going to have a coffee cup, so I'll just bear with me. I'm getting over a little cold. <coughs> um, if you want to wear something in the water, if you're planning on laboring in the water, burning in the water, and you're wanting to wear something on top, that's totally fine. You also don't have to. It's whatever you feel right, whatever feels right to you. If you are going to wear something on top, though, <clears throat> I want you to think about bringing more than one of those things, okay? <coughs> the reason <coughs> is that if you're in the water and you've got this on and then you get out of the water, to labor somewhere else, you're gonna to wanna to take the wet something off and then put something dry on. And then if you get back in the water, you know, it's like you wanna have a few things so that you can always have something dry to wear if you're wanting to wear something on top. Um, so just think about those things as you're packing your birth bag. <clears throat> um, once you're in this space too, <coughs> sorry. <coughs> This happens to me sometimes when I talk too much. So, um, once you are in the birth space here too, um, 
we're going to have lots of things for you to rotate through in labor. You're going to be rotating through a lot of the things that you were doing at home, but there's going to be some extra little things that you can do here, which is part of the benefit of doing a good portion of your labor here at the birth center. Now, after they've done your blood pressure and listened to baby, they're just going to observe you for a little while. They will offer a cervical check, especially if this is your first. <clears throat> if it's not your first, they're less likely to offer that. It's pretty easy to observe a person in labor and kind of get a gauge on where they are at in their labor process. It can be a little more difficult if it's your first baby. However, I want to be very clear that even if it is your first, you do not have to come in and immediately have a cervical exam if that is not, if you're not feeling it. Um, cervical exams here are always consensual. Um, that is, it's very important to us that you're feeling okay with that. Now, sometimes people are like, yeah, I'm cool. Like you can do whatever. I want to see where I'm at too. Other times people don't want to. And if you're not feeling ready for that, like I said, whether it's your first or not, they're just going to take time then and observe how you're doing. They're going to watch different things and try and gauge that way versus doing an internal exam. The internal exam, what it does is it just gives them some information, right? So it gives them information that we already talked about, like where your cervix is at, where your baby's at, what position your baby's in. They can feel where the, uh, the position of the baby externally. It's a little bit easier to do it <clears throat> internally as well, but not necessary. So just keep that in mind. <coughs> um, <clears throat> the cervical exam, it's, um, if you do choose to do it, it's uncomfortable for some people, and for some people it's not. Everybody's just very, very different, um, but they'll def they're, they're super awesome at being gentle and really, um, like, they're just telling you the whole step of the way, like, what's going on and things like that. So if you've had a baby in the hospital before and you've experienced cervical exams, it's not the same here. It's, it's very, very different. So, um, but... If you do choose to have one, kind of where they're looking, they're, they're wanting you to be around a six. Now, does that mean if you're at a four or five, they're gonna say, go home? Not necessarily. They might say, you know, let's see what happens in the next hour. Let's walk around the birth center. Let's do some stairs. Let's kind of, you know, move around and see um, where you're at. Everybody's different. Um, everybody's story is different, and you'll just kind of have to see where yours, um, how yours plays out. But usually, it's around that six centimeters dilated that they're looking for if you choose to to get an exam. Once you um, are in the birth center, we'll get that tub filling up, and you can use the tub freely throughout labor. Um, I personally think the tub is the most relieving in labor um, for discomfort out of all of the different options. Um, the shower is great too, so there's a large shower in each room and that's going to provide a lot of relief too. Um, in the shower you can do a lot of the different positions that I showed you guys on that sheet and I actually have that sheet printed off in the birth room so you can take a look at that if you need to while you're in there. Uh, but there's bars in there, you can put a ball in there, there's lots of active things you can do in the shower. Um, the tub, if you come in and you're definitely in active labor and you're staying, but they just want to see your labor get to kind of a different level before you get in the tub, they might say that. So you might say, oh, can I get in the tub? And you, they might say, you know what, yeah, we're gonna fill the tub up, it takes a while to get it filled up, Let's see how you go for a little bit and then we'll get in the tub. The only reason they're doing that is because they don't want things to slow down for you and sometimes the tub can do that um, at certain points in labor. So, um, But you definitely can, can use the tub for relief. Um, balls, birth stools are great. Um, one of the rooms has the birth sling which is super helpful. I want to talk about two other things that we have at the birth center that can be nice for relief too and one of them is the TENS unit. So we have this here, <clears throat> and as a doula, I carry one of these lovely things around as well. And I don't, is anybody familiar with a CHENS unit? Like physiotherapists use them, chiropractors sometimes, yeah. So it helps like if someone throws their back out or something like that, um, 
some different medical professionals will use TENS units to help with that muscle pain. This one is very specific mm -hmm. to labor. So this is used in lots of other countries all the time. It's just America is not, um, we don't use it as much. But it's a it can be a really useful tool for people. Um, for people that, sometimes I put it on people and they don't like it at all and then I just take it off. But for other people, it's like the thing that really helped them when they weren't in the water. So the, I have to take, you have to take this off if you're getting in the water, but outside of the water, it's great. Um, people say that if they have back labor, the TENS unit's super, super helpful, but it's, it's useful for regular labor too. So just remember that we have it. I feel like it's kind of an underutilized tool at the birth center. Um, it doesn't always get brought out. So partners especially remember that we have this um, and that you can use it. So there's four electrodes. Um, let's see if there's an open pair. I'm just going to open them. So there's four little electrodes that hook up to these wires. And they go on your back. And they're very, very sticky. Um, they look like this. So two of these go on both sides of your spine, just under like where your bra would go. And then the other two go just below that, kind of where your underwear would hit. And so, and they're hooked up to these little cords, and then we turn it on. And when we turn it on, what you feel is this little like tingling, pulsing sensation. And we can turn up the frequency like and to a level where you're like, okay, that's enough. Um, and you'll know when it's enough. And it doesn't hurt or anything like that. It's just a tingling sensation. And then that, you're just feeling that like in between your contractions. And then once the contraction starts, there's this boost button, and you push the boost button, and it revs up that sensation during your contraction, and it's like this wave, these waves of the, of the, the tingling sensation, and then when your contraction's over, you unclick the boost, and that's that. You can do the boost button if you want, your partner can do the boost button, your doula, um, whoever, it feels right. Um, for some people in labor, that are really wanting a sense of control, um, this can be nice. This can kind of give you that little, it's like, okay, I'm getting my um, <laughs> feeling soothed of wanting to be in control. So, but I honestly find more often than not that people in labor don't want to be in charge of this um, and that whoever's supporting them is doing the boost button. What it does ultimately is it actually creates more endorphins. So, it sends a signal to your brain that you're not only feeling a sensation here, you're also feeling a sensation in the back, and you, um, with, from this, not from labor hopefully, but you're, you're feeling sensations on both sides, and it causes your body to create more endorphins. As you remember, endorphins are pain relieving, so it can be super helpful. People that like it say that it cut their like labor pain or discomfort by about 50%. Mm -hmm. So it, it's pretty significant if it works for you. Um, so, so it's a good little, good little thing to try. The other thing that we have here that's good to know about is specific to back labor, and that's sterile water injections. So if you are experiencing back labor, we're going to be doing lots of different things in positions to get baby to shift and move. But it is still painful to have back labor, and so sterile water injections can be super helpful and basically what is it it's literally just putting a little bit of sterile water in four points on your back and for most people not all but for most it relieves back labor for up to three hours like got completely done mm -hmm. which is pretty incredible um, you can do it as many times as you want so if it wears off and you're still having back labor and you want to do it again you can totally do it again there's nothing wrong with it it doesn't hurt anything well, it kind of does hurt. It hurts to get it injected. <laughs> um, people say that it kind of feels like a bee sting, um, but people say that where because it relieves all that back labor, it's like, whoa, so, so worth it. So just know we can do that too. And then the other thing I want to talk about is nitrous oxide. So nitrous oxide is something that is here. You can try it. Um, I've seen it enjoyed by people. Um, 
a, you know, a, quite a few times. I would say maybe like 20% of people try it, and of those 20%, maybe half of those like it. Um, you can just try it, and if you don't like it, we just put it away, and you feel totally normal within a couple of minutes. That's the really nice thing, because it clears your system very fast. It does not cross the placenta, so the baby's not getting any of that. Um, unlike the dentist, you're not, like, you know, if you've ever had it at the dentist, you're, like, laying back, and you've got this mask, and you're just, like, in complete la-la land. Um, it's not like that here, because you're in control of the mask, and you're taking it off and putting it on, and people tend to just kind of get into a rhythm of off and on, um, obviously, usually they're putting it on during a contraction and then they're taking it off during their break. And they just keep doing it that way. Now, there's no rules except partners can't use it. <laughs> um, so many partners don't use it. They're <laughs> like, can I just have some of that? Uh, unfortunately, no. Um, but what I mean by no rules is like, you don't have to take it off if you don't want to, but I will tell you, if you're going to keep it on your face and not take breaks, you're going to get pretty loopy, okay? So the sensation is like, I guess, feeling high. People will describe it as that. I've had people say it feels like a couple glasses of wine. I've had people, just recently, the person the other day said it, it did feel like a marijuana high. Um, those are the descriptions that I've gotten from people. Now, if it starts to feel like too much, then you just take it off and just take your break from it. And like I said, you got to kind of find your rhythm. Um, I did support someone recently, and they have not here, like 10 hours straight, matrix. Not even taking it off. <laughs> just on. <laughs> the whole time. For like 10 hours. And I'm like, wow. I mean, you know. It got her through it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, hey, it, it worked for her, but I don't see that. I, I really don't see that very often. Usually people need a break from it. So, anyways, it's, it's here to try. You don't have to be in the bed. Um, obviously, you can be, but you can even be in the tub, which is kind of cool because you're getting relief of the tub and from the nitrous, which is like double. Um, so, I think that can be super effective. Um, so yeah, those are the different things to try here in active labor. Um, the birth assistant and the midwife will definitely be supporting you throughout. Um, if you do have a doula, they, they probably will just kind of let you guys hang out with your doula a lot of the time and they'll be in and out supporting and doing vitals and things like that, but they are pretty respectful of your space and, um, and what you're needing during labor. As things start to intensify, um, you might notice things like nausea creeping in. Um, and if you do feel sick, uh, peppermint oil can be nice. Just a little bit of peppermint oil breathing that or ginger oil can be helpful. Um, throwing up a time or two in labor is actually great. I know it sounds terrible, but it's great. Um, <laughs> It's not great if you're doing a lot of it, because then you might need some fluids or some more hydration. But one or two times, we're like, yes. <laughs> when all those things happen, we get excited. And not you don't see our excitement, because we, we actually do also feel bad that you're throwing up. But it does a lot of good things, because when you throw up in labor, if you can imagine all that like pressure happening, it's like you're contracting and laboring and then you're throwing up and it's like all that's happening at once and baby's just like boom, down and get really down low in the pelvis. So it actually is really good and a lot of progression happens when, when vomiting starts. So just throwing that out there. Um, it's good to urinate frequently throughout labor as well. So just be mindful of that. Um, the more you empty your bladder, the better, because it helps with labor progression. It allow, allows for more space for the baby. Um, we absolutely love the toilet in labor. Um, we, you probably will spend time on the toilet in labor here. Um, you know, when like you'll say like, oh, I'm gonna go to the bathroom, and they'll be like, great, sit in there, and like sit through three, four, five contractions. Um, they'll usually give you a little bit of a goal because the toilet is super intense. Um, and you want to lean into those intense places. So the toilet's intense, and if you, but if you find other places that are intense too, you just want to lean into that, and they're going to tell you that. They're going to say, lean in, accept that, you know, just 
let that be there. That's another thing that we say a lot here at the birth center. Um, because in those intense places, that's where lots and lots of good progression is happening. So we're going to encourage you to stay there. In those intense places, we don't expect you, expect you to stay there for an hour. We just want you to stay there for a little bit of time. And so we usually will give you a little goal, like I said. Like, if the toilet's really intense, we'll say, okay, let's get through six contractions on the toilet. And then you can get up. And I better, they, people count. They're like, okay, mm -hmm. I'm at four. They are keeping track. Um, but it's a really good spot. So on the toilet, what we do is we have you turn around backwards and we'll put pillows up there and then you can just lean over the back of the toilet. Why is the toilet good? Um, it's good because it's a place where our body releases. It's a place where our body naturally knows like, oh, this is where I open up. This is where I go to the bathroom. So all those muscles are going to open up and it allows for baby to move down and lots of really good things happen on the toilet. So it might sound kind of funny, but it's, it's very, very true. And the birth video I'm going to show you, it shows someone laboring on, laboring on the toilet and it's like where the magic happens. Um, the labor I was at the other day here, actually, it's tr like she wanted to get up. I, I she she would sit on the toilet and the contraction would start and she'd be like, nope, I'm getting up. Like, I'm not seeing. And I'm like, no, no, we just have to sit. Just sit. Like, we're just going to get through. I gave her a number. I can't remember how many. And I just had to tell her that whole contraction. Like, keep sitting, keep sitting, keep sitting. And it truly was, like, it. And then after that, she, like, boom, was in, like, super, super active labor. And her baby came not that long after. So I, I've seen that happen so many times. So it's a good place to be. Um, another thing that you might start to notice here and there is some shakiness in your body. So it doesn't necessarily mean that you're cold, but your hormones are just surging. And when you have these big surges of hormones, you get shakes. Um, and it kind of looks like you're cold and shivering, but it's really just your body shaking from the hormones. So it's very normal um, and natural. So don't worry about that. You will probably notice too that you're hot and you're cold and hot and cold and then you'll just have to take things off and put things back on and um, we'll adjust the temp in the room and all of that for you but your temperature um, is fluctuating like what feels comfortable is fluctuating quite a bit. Um, are there like oh, fans here? Yes, okay. yeah. So there are fans. Um, I will say that when the tub is full in those rooms it gets like a little jungle in there. Um, it does, you know, it's just humid and hot, and, but we will do our best if you're really hot to, you, we can open windows, we can turn on fans, yeah. um, we get a bowl of ice water and we'll just put icy cloths on your body mm -hmm. so you feel really good, um, but it does get warm. So for partners, layers, it, layers are important. Um, you know, take off, put on. Um, I always find as a support person, I'm always very cold in birth rooms, so I bring lots of layers, but not here. <laughs> not a Twin Cities birth center with those toasts. It is toasty. Um, but it's good, it's good, because when the baby comes out, they're just like, ah, it's warm here. Um, and I think it's really good, so. Um, for active labor too, just some like gentle reminders. We already talked about the sounds, but a lot of focus on breath um, throughout. So slow deep breaths. That's the main thing, slow deep breaths. I'm not going to give you a pattern or a certain way to breathe. It truly is just slow deep breaths and that looks different for everyone. Um, sometimes like there's a method where you take four, like it's four seconds in and eight seconds out. So if things like that are helpful to you, those are definitely things that you can practice in your labor. Um, I never did like a certain pattern, but I just did slow deep breaths, and that's kind of how I tell people to do it. Um, if you do yoga or things like that, yoga breathing is obviously really good. Um, so I will tell people also like in through your nose, out through your mouth, but just nice relaxed breathing. Um, breathing is a really good in indicator too of feeling stressed or worried. So if your breathing starting to pick up, or if you're holding breath, um, you're going to be reminded to just keep up with, with the nice, slow, deep breaths. Um, and then the vocalizations, of course, too. And then just relaxing every muscle in your body. Um, those are gonna, those are the main um, three things. Um, I want to talk a little bit about music. So if you want music, bring music. Create a playlist. But just know you might create this beautiful playlist and then not want anything to do with it in labor. 
Um, you're not going to know until the time is here if you want music or not. Um, so have it ready. If you're a music lover, I think it can be a nice addition to the room. Um, aromatherapy, love it, love it so much in labor if you're open to essential oils. Um, oftentimes I just put the essential oils on like little gauze pads for people. We do have a diffuser. Um, things like we, we use lavender a lot, peppermint oil for nausea. Peppermint's also good for waking up. Like so if you're feeling really tired and you're needing an energy boost, peppermint's great. Um, so is citrus oils, those are really nice, like orange, lemon. Um, clary sage. So we have clary sage here and clary sage is actually an essential oil that helps bring on contractions. So it's a favorite here for sure. And it was like, again, this birth I was at the other day, it was like magic. Um, at first I had her just smelling it and then Amy, the owner, she was here too because she was helping. Um, and she saw it working for this person so it really was just bringing on strong contractions and that's what it's for and that's what i love it for and amy's like start diffusing that I'm like, okay i'm always nervous to diffuse an oil because i'm if someone gets tired of it it's hard to get it out of the room so if you are choosing to diffuse something make sure you love it and you don't hate it um and, and there's not like room for you to hate it like you have to really really like it um, anyway, so we, we did diffuse that and I, I don't know, it was like a magic potion mm -hmm. that really worked. Um, so that's a really good one. We do have it here. If you have essential oils that you love and that you're attached to, definitely bring them because you can use them here. Um, other, so for eating and drinking, um, we're still thinking about drinking at least one sip after every contraction, but we talked a little bit, bit about early labor eating and how you can eat more during early labor. Active labor, your appetite is not there as much, but it's still important to eat. So you want to think about eating things that are gentle and mild on your tummy, things that are easy to chew and swallow. The reason I say that is because people like literally cannot contract and chew at the same time. <laughs> Just the they spit it out. Um, the other day, this other person, I think she was chewing something and she actually took it out of her mouth and threw it at her partner. It was hilarious. It wasn't being mean. You know, she was just like, oh yeah, I can't chew this. And she threw it. Anyways, you really, it's a real thing. So think about things that are easy, to, that you can just take quick bites of, chew, and swallow in between your contractions. Um, things that I love, nut butter. So those little packets of nut butter, like the little travel packs, are great because you can just tear off a corner, suck it down, and you're good to go. And you've got some good protein and carbs and things and a little bit of sugar um, that's going to be helpful. The applesauce packets or any of those little packets that it could be applesauce, fruits, veggies, uh, the chia ones are great. Again, you just take the top off and you can eat that in like a second and you're going to get a little boost from that. Um, protein bars are good. I, I like those. Usually people don't get through a whole one, but even if you can have a few bites of them, great. Um, that's going to be really helpful. Yours, that's a good brand, RX. Yeah. That's my favorite. Yeah, I really like that one. Um, so those are all really good things um, to try. So you want to think about protein, carbs, kind of together if you can. Um, pack those in your bag. Partners, you know, definitely bring things for you to eat too. Um, it's super important to keep up on your eating and drinking as well. Um, so bring lots of stuff for yourself as well. Um, yeah, those are just some different um, snack ideas. I like things that are really flavorful too. So funny enough, things that are really flavorful can also bring us joy and create endorphins. So popsicles, great thing. Um, fruit snacks, things that are really fruity and flavorful um, create endorphins, which is really cool. So if you like those things, those are also nice little sugar boosters in labor. Um, we always have honey here, so we'll give people a spoonful of honey to get their energy levels up. Um, what else do we have? We have emergency packets. Those are a favorite, like the little powder. And we also have oatmeal. So um, those are the main things. Oatmeal is a really nice labor snack because it's full of good carbs and um, it sticks with you and it's, you know, so that's, that's a favorite here and it's easy to eat. So. Don't have to bring oatmeal unless you don't like maple flavor. Um, <laughs> bring your own, but, but we do have some here. Um, 
We don't standardly do IVs or anything like that here in labor, um, but it's available to you. Obviously, the GBS side of things, we do have um, IVs available for that. But if you need some fluids and you're getting dehydrated, that is something that we can do here, and sometimes it's just the thing that people needs, or need. Um, now, uh, active labor, I do want to say, how long is it? Um, it's very different for everyone. Statistically, they will say that it's about a centimeter an hour. So if you think about that, like a few hours here. Now, once you hit transition, which is 8 to 10, so 8 centimeters to 10 centimeters, usually transition is not a centimeter an hour. It's, it's usually quite a bit quicker. For some people, it's super fast, especially if it's not your first baby. Um, but even first baby, sometimes it can be pretty quick. It's not usually something that lingers um, for, for most people. So transition is uh, pro probably the hardest part of labor. It's the most intense part of labor. It's when contractions are moving from every like three minutes to maybe every two minutes or maybe every minute. Like it's just boom, boom. People are feeling like they're not getting much of a break at all, and they're, they're not, um, because they're pretty on top of each other. It is when the most progression happens, and it's happening fast. It's the last bit of work that your cervix has to do. So, so it, it, there's a lot of sensation happening there. Um, Oft, very often people get shaky, very often people throw up once during transition. Um, the support looks much the same from partners, so still doing that counter pressure, or it's, you know, verbal encouragement, things like that, and just being very present during this time. Um, it is the time where people, pretty much every time, almost, they feel like they want to give up, and they say it, they will tell you. I'm done, I don't want to do this anymore, I want to go home, I changed my mind, <laughs> I want a C-section, I want an epidural, like it's all these things are coming out and it doesn't matter what number baby it is um, because it's so it hard, good. it's so intense. What? It just feels good to say sometimes. It just feels good. You, you don't mean it, get it's it out. to say. Yeah, like, <laughs> you just gotta get it out. I would say probably the most common is I don't want to do it anymore. Or I can't, I can't do this anymore. And so you're going to hear things from your support team like, you can do this, you are doing this, you're going to get through this, we're doing it one at a time, one contraction at a time, each one is getting you closer to your baby. You're going to hear that over and over again, and it's, it's true. So I think the most important thing to know about transition is actually partner support, because the person in transition is just in it. You're just in it and you're doing it and it's hard and you're going to get through it. Um, you're going to get to the other side of it, but partners can be like, huh, wait, like, does she really want an epidural? Does she really want a C-section? Does she really want to, you know, can she really not do this? Because this really does look hard. You know, she can do it. Um, and she's saying these things just because it is hard and she will get through it. So just lots of support. Um, and, and what I want to say about the epidural piece is if your person changes their mind and wants to go to the hospital for pain relief, some people do that, about 5% of people do that here, and it's okay, but I promise you, you will know that, and it's going to be different than what I'm talking about. This is something that passes, and they get through it. If someone is very adamant and very serious about wanting pain management at the hospital, you will know it because they will look you in the eye and they will be very, very serious about that. So it, it is, there is a difference there. Um, right, so the rest of, but, but transition, like I said, you get through it and it's, it's gonna be hard and then all of a sudden, transition's over and you get there and you get to this place and you as the person in labor you don't even really notice it like you get there but you don't notice it uh, but the people around you notice it and after transition your cervix is, is dilated and usually your contractions space out just a little bit more so they're not a minute or two minutes apart usually they go back to three minutes apart or four or even five sometimes it does not always mean it's time to push. Um, sometimes it does, but not always. So sometimes after transition, as we're easing into the pushing stage, we have 30 minutes or an hour of just laboring. 
uh, with these contractions that are easier than they just were. And we call this the rest to be thankful stage. Um, <laughs> because it's true. We want you to rest and just be thankful that things are manageable again. Um, and it's kind of like your body's gearing up for the next part. Because the next part is you got to put a lot of energy into it. It's pushing. Um, but sometimes your body needs a little bit of break before that starts. Now, eventually what's going to happen though, and sometimes this is towards the end of transition, during transition, after, it's just different for everyone, but you will start to feel the sensation of wanting to push. It doesn't always, your mind doesn't always click with that right away. You start feeling the sensation, but you're not really thinking of it in terms of pushing. Um, you feel the pressure there in your bottom, um, and it just feels like you have to go to the bathroom. Um, that's truly the best way to describe it. I'm not sure that there's another way to describe it because all of the same muscles and everything, all of that is being pushed on just like it is when you do need to have a bowel movement. When you do start to feel that way, usually what happens is you start to feel like you have to go to the bathroom um, and you feel the pressure in your bottom during a contraction and then the contraction lets up and you don't feel that anymore in between. So that's just your body getting closer. It's your baby, you're getting closer, but it's not quite time to push yet. Um, eventually you'll just have this irresistible urge to, to push and that you're having that pressure sensation all the time during contraction and in between your contractions.